Tonight, Prodigy Hellraiser, Keith Flint. Sheffield Suavist, Jarvis Cocker. And New Order's Heart and Soul, Bernard Sumner. Also, tweaking the frequencies live, West Country Cowboys, Portishead. And Hunted Soul Seductress and Dare Davenport. Hi, I'm Joe Wiley. Welcome to the show. Well, it's been another chic week on the impeccably groomed couture clad catwalk that is popular music. And here, ready to sashay on down, are Jarvis. Hello. Thanks for coming. Keith and Hi. Bernard. Hi there. So, is Ian Brown still King Monkey? Is Sean Lennon a stain on the family name? And was Acid House and the summer of 88 right on one matey or just big dungarees and bad trips? We'll try and surf the flotsam over the next 45 minutes, but for now, let's hoover over the last seven days in pop. FHM magazine has just published their annual readers poll for the world's 100 sexiest women, and our pop baits fare quite well. Luscious Louise scores highest at number three. Delicious Danny Minogue scores higher than her sister at number 13, though Smiley Kylie moves up an amazing 42 places. High new entries this year include the girl whose name is a bit of a mouthful, Natalie Imbruglia, and the marvellous Melanie Blatt, who despite being betrothed, is the highest rated All Saint. It's a poor year for the Spice Girls though, with every girl dropping down the list, Jerry falling a staggering 50 places. Must be those platform shoes. Another bit of top totty is Tally star Tracy Shaw, who plays Coronation Street crimper Maxine. But she's hoping to move out of the hair salon and into the charts, as she releases her debut single in a few weeks. Not to be outdone, her Cory co-star, the marvellous mechanic Matthew Martin, is planning on servicing the chart with his song Heart's Lone Desire. Let's hope their combined efforts are better than our Jacks. Another soap star who achieved chart success was one time Queen of the Vic, Anita Dobson. Now more well known for dating old Queen member and walking perm, Brian May. In this month's Q magazine, who wanted Brian was asked whether he'd ever had his hair cut. His reply, I like it because it's unfashionable and I despise fashion. Well, Brian, fashion despises you. Rod Stewart has been speaking of his wide variety of interests outside music. Last week he spoke of his love of train sets and said he'd love to make the cover of Roe Modeler magazine. Well, he always had an eye for hot models and particularly likes watching his steaming locomotive enter and re-enter a tunnel continuously for hours on end. But this week, the hot legs rocker spoke of his love of girls' panties. He says he used to wear ex-girlfriend Britt Eklund's knickers, but they were uncomfortable in the front. Obviously, they were not big enough for his hot rod. Fleetwood Mac has been accused of being in league with the devil by a parish minister in Huntsville, Alabama. Minister Scott Naden described singer Stevie Nicks as a witch and Satan worshipper. Perhaps the good reverend would prefer the gospel preached by one-hit wonders, the Reynolds Girls. Well said, girls. The World Cup starts next week, but the battle for the top of the charts is hotting up, and the two main teams have been sparring with each other off the field. Firstly, Ian McCulloch has been mouthing off about Keith Allen, the man behind Fat Les's Vindaloo. He says he should go back to being a comedian, he's a shambles. But comic Keith came back with this. Uh, McCulloch, listen, you're a good man, you're a family man, we've spoken about this. You're a family man, you look after your kids, stick to it, because music and you are going a long, long way apart. About to strike again. Jarvis, you've been photographed on football pitches uh, over the past few years. Yeah. Looking very mean and frightening. Look, well, yeah, looking like I really ought to be there. Yeah. yeah, right. Where do you stand on this kind of battle of the football anthems? Well, it's hard because cause I haven't really heard that Keith Allen one. I heard a little bit of it on World Service last night because I've been... But, uh, World Service, right? I mean, I, the other one is so crap that I can't really think that the other one, you know, the Keith Allen one's worse. It's difficult I, to make I, a worse record, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, I, I really don't like that other one. Right. Why do you, do you think everyone was just completely misguided in getting involved with it? Should they kind of recognise that it was a crap record in the beginning? I mean, like Spice Girls, the bloke from Motion Colour Scene, Tommy from Space, Ian McCulloch. 
I know, well, well, they asked me to like, do it and all. So did they? I, yeah, yeah, so... Uh, and did you hear the record like and then say no? It's vaguely insulted, I must say. It's bad because, you know, I was an Echo and the Bunnymen fan in the youth. I thought they were great, you know, and um, it's kind of a bit sad when somebody that you respected makes something so poo. Yes. Would you um, stoop to making, I don't know, joining up with Def Leppard and doing something for, is it Sheffield Wednesday that you support? I really hope not. I hope that somebody would, you know, take me out if I did anything like that, yeah. Yeah, I hope so. Keith, what about you? You've often been seen sporting a Union Jack. Would you be interested in Scotland at all in the World Cup or do you care about football I, at all? I don't care for football at all. Not in the slightest, tell you the truth. Um, What's your sport then? Um, sort of motorsports, really. If if at all, yeah, yeah. So you're going to be able to ignore the World Cup? Will you be? What will you be doing while um, it's on? Well, them sort of things are thrown in your face, you know. So yeah, I'll do my best to. I should imagine I'll be sort of gigging and stuff. So you know, doing your best to ignore yeah, it anyway. Yeah, of course. Yeah, of course, Bernard. From a uh, world in motion to bowel well, motions that uh, we have at the moment with the <laughs> football songs. Of course, I taught Keith everything he knows about football songs. What does he like to work with? A really delightful, sort of mild mannered, na really nice person, yeah. Is he He's really? uh, great to work with. But I also know Ian McCulloch, so I've got to be very careful what I say here. Okay. But Keith actually phoned me up just before the start of this show. Did he offer you money or threaten you? He said that their record sold 400,000 and it's going to go in at number one next week. And it, you, it is a beautiful tune, it's really nice. <laughs> it's kind of like, a, I like the kind of. Beauty. It's almost like a classical melody that mm. he sings in it. A touch of Beethoven in there. Mm. Uh, okay. I really like it. So yeah. Your money's well, on like, Vindaloo. I, I like uh, the. Uh, you like on top of the world. No, you're just scared. You're just scared. It's different. It's different. Right. No, good luck. You know, good luck to both of them. Fine. Yeah. Do you still get haunted by uh, the thought of John Barnes rapping? Does that kind of go through your head? At well, time? we actually uh, um, on that record we we tried all the England players and um, doing the rap. And we had, there's actually a tape knocking around of Gaza doing the rap, is which there? is uh, oh, wow. hilarious, you know. You should dig yeah. that out. Well, it must have been really exciting when, when all that happened, being linked with the World Cup. I don't get excited that often, to be honest. Don't you? We'll do our best tonight. <laughs> we'll do our best. With um, the big news, obviously, in pop this week is the Spice Girls and Jerry quitting the Spice gone, Girls. Yeah, yeah. Um, do you care, Jarvis? It was funny, I was thinking about it on the way here, saying, they should get uh, Sonia out of retirement to replace her. <laughs> I don't think she's retired, uh, actually. Boys, well, boys, yeah. boys, boys. Nah, that, no, that was Sabrina, weren't it? No, you know, yeah, Sonia. Was Sabrina. Yeah, Sabrina's yeah. maybe a better idea. With, with the, yeah, but she's got ginger yeah. hair. Who was Sonia? She was from the Lockheed Waterman with the ginger hair. Yeah. Yeah. Right, what was her? What was her she's in Bread now, I think. She's a serious actress. Is she? Yeah. Well, I'm sure well, she's like another knock at pop stardom. Yeah. Jarvis not been watching a lot of television because he's been over to India. Yeah. Right, he's been out. Of yeah. He's a bit out of touch, TV-wise. No, but, but do, yeah, do, uh, does, does it matter to you that the Spice well, Girls well, might no longer exist? The thing that does mean about it, I mean, it was quite a weird thing when they pissed the manager off, you know, because I thought, well, it's a bit early. It's like, usually people wait till they've written their own songs and stuff like that before they decide to get really oity-toity and they want to go their own way. Mm. I thought they did write their own songs. Did the egg. You're joking. Keith Allen writes them. And Spice that, Girls don't uh, write their own songs. And then, uh, I, I don't know what she's going to do. No. Have you got any theories about what happened? No. But she, she, I, I can see her as like a Diana Dawes figure. Yeah. For next century. Yeah. She kind of is already, isn't she? Yeah. Mm. Which really makes me feel ill. <laughs> Maybe she'll do the, um, like the Cilla Black show. You know how that kind of was like variety pop, it was the whole <coughs> thing. <coughs> you can imagine it, yeah. yeah. Will you lose uh, sleep, sleep over it, Keith? No, not at all, it, you know. Um, have you ever played on the same bill as the Spice Girls? No. No, we haven't. No. It surprises me. <laughs> no, it's not the sort of thing that happens, I don't think. Um, Spice Girls, it's just one of them things that, that you know, people love to hate or want to sort of talk about and have opinions on, but it doesn't really bother me either way if she leaves or stays. And, just don't care. No, not really. Bernard, could well, it's, you? It's music for kids, really, isn't it? It's like, you know, it's their children's entertainment. Have you got kids? Yeah, I feel. Are they into the Spice Girls? Loads of them. So are they? <laughs> no, how many at last actually, count? They're into uh, uh, Marchiba and oh. um, 
uh, mass attack. How old are they? Um, two and three. Oh, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> really cool. Did you, did you think it'd be Jerry that left the Spice Girls, or could you see it coming from any of the others? Well, actually, uh, Posh Spice and David Beckham have just moved in up the road from me. Oh, have they? Yeah, they have. You live in so. a posh area, then? I do, yeah. Uh, well, no, there's a bit, there's like a border where it goes really horrible. Right, Very that's quick. where you are. I live in, yeah, it's called Moss Side where I, li I live. <laughs> and they live in Alderley Edge and uh, they've just moved in. But it's very close together, you see. I live in the rough bit, right. the street bit, and they live in the uh, Stockbroke belt. Right. So hopefully we're going to be good friends. You know? Yeah, you can chuck beer cans into their garden and yeah. play more cheaper really loudly. Yeah. Um, Jarvis, Fleetwood Mac are the devil. Discuss. Um, yeah, it was funny because discipline. they were on the telly last night and I thought um, whoever designs the clothes is probably in league with the devil. <laughs> Mike, Mick Fleetwood with them tights and them like kind of pom-pom efforts <laughs> hanging down the front. Yeah. You could sort. Eh? Hey? <laughs> what? <laughs> but um, I, d I don't know the background to that. I mean, why? It seems a bit late for for the for somebody to catch on to them seeing as like you know they've been around for so long mm. why is this minister only just kind of it takes a on? long time to reach southern america doesn't it sometimes yeah. a lot of things to penetrate over there but i mean just fleetwood mac generally have you ever been a fan of their music <coughs> i have to admit that i have you have which I particular bought, era i almost bought that album rumors yeah when it was out yeah i can remember really debating about it but, I used but you to didn't well no because i i looked at the back of the record and out of like 12 songs or whatever there's on it, I'd taped about six of them off the radio because they had loads of singles off it and I thought it weren't worth paying no. for just six songs that you hadn't heard. But you've never so bought long. it at a second-hand record shop since? I haven't, no. Yeah. no. America seems to see the devil in just about every groove that comes along. They're all kind of deeply suspicious. Well, when they're playing backwards and that. What was that Queen one? It's fun to smoke marijuana. <laughs> well, we actually did New Order, we put we did put a backward message on one of the records, but no one ever got it. What was it? Your mother sucks cocks in hell. It was. <laughs> <laughs> what we record? Did, honest God, it was on uh, the B side of. Uh, I'll tell you after the show, memory's not what it used to be, but we did actually do it. Okay, so everyone has to go through their entire new order. The vinyl reason, it's collection. a B side. It came out around this, one of the singles that came off uh, that album. Uh, we'll tell you on next week's I'll show. Tell you, I'll tell you later. Okay. Share with us then. Keith, um, in America, you're kind of like this walking Sodom and Gomorrah, the way they look at you and see you as the devil incarnate. Yeah, not had... really. I mean, I think I've had more, more trouble in Britain than in America. Really? Yeah, I think Marilyn Manson's sort of keeping them sort of... Uh, well occupied. Well, yeah, well amused at the moment, so... What about when you're on top of the pops here or, or when Firestarter was shown and people... Yeah, there freak. was a few, you know, a few things, you know, a few vicars and priests sort of wrote in saying it was... <laughs> satanic and stuff. I mean, we've had people turn up at the house and uh, sort of say, I can save you. Oh, and, holy water You know, and stuff. God has sent me and uh, I know your obsession with fire and... Uh, what was it about, uh, first that? What was it about? Um, Just trying to think. Yeah, it was just like, just a, 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 a moment, a moment in time, a moment on stage, yeah. a little part of myself. And uh, just a vibe, just a vibe that was that we had in the studio, and that's about it, really. What uh, do your parents say, like when they hear people going on about you and saying that you're the devil? Do they get protective, or do they um, say, "Oh, maybe well, Keith"? Uh, you know, I don't do it for my parents, and they, they don't really come into play. So, I, but they must say something to you. They must have some kind of an opinion they don't, about the image. I don't really talk to them, so it doesn't. Really? Yeah. So. It doesn't really uh, bother me either way. Yeah. Does it annoy you when photographs come out of you when you're dead normal? It's people like trying to score a point over you and saying, look, he's not really that rebellious. Um, or is yeah, it really that's obviously, yeah, I suppose that... Well, it's more sort of people prying into your, your private life and stuff, but um, <coughs> at the end of the day, we're, you know, if you're six and they've given, they put, you know, there's a picture of you when you're six, I mean, no one at six has tattoos. No, but I did. I got thrown out of school for having a Mohican when I was um, about 14. You thought he was born like that, didn't you? Everyone had Mohicans when they were 14, though, didn't they? Yeah. Okay. 
yeah, my old man threw me at home, all the usual sort of get out of this house and the night to have, and then the school said, you know, you can't have your hair like that. So I got whisked down the barbers and they sort of like, sort of did their thing with it and it was fucking Was it like a skinhead? No, no, they sort of, they tried to sort of put a, a fringe type sort of situation <laughs> in there. It was really, it looked like yours actually. <laughs> Yeah, well, I can farm, you know, I can but, farm. Look, but, I've um, done all right for myself. Yeah. No, but, you know. Yeah. When did you first get your piercings and tattoos? When did that all start? Um, After the Mohican? No, no, I mean, it's one of them things on and off, really. I've, I was in Israel about 11 years ago and some American girls were going on about how attractive they thought it was to have your nose pierced. So Straight down so, there. <laughs> They were doing it on the street. We was all working on the streets, sort or of selling jewellery and uh, doing them hair wrap things and stuff like that. And um, <coughs> yeah, I thought, yeah, I have it done. So I had my nose pierced here. Sorry. Cheers. And um, and then I sort of like, you know, got in, had my ears pierced all round here and stuff. And um, you know, it's one of them things. And then I sort of got into it, and then sort of wasn't into it. In fact, I was, it was like the party scene had just started and everyone's out and, um, you know, you're off your head as, as normal in, you know, the parties and stuff. And people were sort of going, you know, sort of pointing here, you know, sort of thinking that you had a booger stuck to your nose, you know. And it was doing my head in, so I sort of took it out. And I had sort of long hair and uh, dancing around and, and stuff and your long hair getting wrapped around it I kept pulling it out and <laughs> you're sort of waiting for these flashing lights to sort of look for this thing so it was more grief so than that explains the hair yeah, yeah yeah I suppose so have you had anything else Pierce that perhaps we can't see I haven't had my dick done no why no. not um Hurts. I don't know really it's one of them things that that you think yeah 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 I might have it done and then so you, you have this run of like three or four festivals coming up and you sort of think, no, I don't want that bounce around in my pants. <laughs> so, you know. do, do they do it through your Jap's eye? You know, through the yeah, they do it crossways, which is like your amplang or something they call it. Right. And then a Prince Albert that actually sort of goes in the hole and sort of out the other side. So I think the amplang's sort of more... Um, it's the woman sexually and the... Prince Albert benefits the man sexually. <coughs> so you've done research into it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, obviously, when you're in the in a in a piercing studio, that you know you, you run over it. The guy in in uh, in um, it's quite it's quite addictive, Wildcat, isn't it? It's called. He, he, he's sort of every time I see him, he says you've got to have it done, got to have it done. But Jarvis, do you feel the urge? Well, I don't, I, mean, I don't know enough about it, but it, it just being down in that area, mm. rusting, etc. No, it won't rust. No? no, 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 you won't get any rust. Split stream when you go for a slash. That is someone, <laughs> someone did. <laughs> 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 that, I think mean, that's, that's <laughs> the thing. <laughs> and I'd, I'd hate to sort of go through something that stopped it sort of performing as, mm. it, as it does. That'd yeah, I mean, awful. yeah, as long as, yeah, I suppose if you had lead weight on it, it would, oh, 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 oh. We can do that as well, can't you? I'd, what? Get lead weights and oh, heavy yeah. weights suspended. Yeah. What, to stretch it or something? Well, just because, I think. Or just to show yeah, off. Satisfaction. Like, yeah. Yeah. But less, less girth, I think. I don't it. know, I mean, I don't <laughs> know whether, I don't know, it, like you say, if it, if it uh, increases your um, pleasure or whatever, then maybe it's something to... Look, look into it, I don't know. Bernard? But there's that bloke who has it under his skin now, have you seen him? Yeah, like, yeah, he yeah. Puts, I saw that, yeah. puts, like, lumps of metal, he has it put Is in it? and then the skin grows over the top. It, it, was, it was some magazine you were going like that Jim and you could just see all these, circus, isn't it? He's, these lumps. It's, it's, oh, that look. Gross. There's a guy who, um, have you seen him, he's got a jigsaw <laughs> tattooed all over himself. He's all blue and he's just one big jigsaw. He had coral horns put here and the coral attaches to the head. And it actually starts yeah. growing under the skin. Oh, Which, but that's no. that. I'm not into that. Great, You're not going to do that. I mean, <laughs> at the end of the day, I mean, a lot of times I take all, everything, all my piercings out and stuff. Do you feel liberated when you do that? You no, not at all. I feel lighter. lighter. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> not liberated. No, I just uh, I take it out, and then everyone goes, "Oh, you know, you look boring." <laughs> yeah. Well, I've yeah. stuck for something to do later on. I'm 
Yeah, we'll find you a nice per but piercing parlour. I'll go get my escort and pissed. <laughs> Well, the Rod Stewart, I think you've already blagged a copy of the album, haven't you? I have, yeah. That was yeah. your fee for coming on the show. Why did you blag the album? Um, because I've not heard it and I wanted to talk about it to you. But right. unfortunately, I didn't have time to play it, so therefore, I didn't hear it, therefore... Okay. Well, he's been talking it's about It's the his... idea, it's the concept of him doing, like, Oasis songs, isn't it? Yeah. See, that's a good idea. You kind of respect him for doing that. Um, I don't know, what do you think, Wait, well, I don't know which song, which, which Oasis song has he done. No, he's done Cigarettes and Alcohol. He's done Skunk and Nancy. He's done which Weak, one? Weak As I Am. Right. He's done Primal Scream and Rocks. That he's done Superstar, do you know Superstar idea. track? What, he's the Carpenters well. one? No, Superstar by Superstar. Oh, right, oh, sorry. No, no I don't know that one. No, though. he's trying to be hip, he's not trying to do the Carpenters this time. I don't know, I haven't heard it, I mean... Do you think he's quite an icon, Rod Stewart? Do you have it? No. It, no. no, not at all. Do you think it's a joke? What, what do you no, think? I don't think it's a joke. I mean, it's, it just reminds me of stuff that your parents are into, really. But then, the, and so the idea of him sort of trying to do primal scream and rocks and yeah, but it's just a, a vain attempt to be hip for a moment. Yeah, but weren't like the faces playing that kind of music anyway? Weren't weren't like they play that kind of music and it's kind of returned the point is it's returned yeah but you to you, what the faces you, were playing you know if you take yeah but but at the end of the day that's what happens they think well i can do that because we were doing it anyway so i'm gonna I'll, I'll prove it that i you know i'll prove that you know i can do it as well as they can but that's that's not the point that's what's what, the point then i don't know what do you think Joe? Yeah. um God, what do you think, Rod? Do you think Java should be retiring? Do you think Rod should be retiring now and giving it all up? Then. Oh, well, it's not for me to say. He obviously, you know, is is in what he's doing. But. Well, Rod Stewart's actually just moved to Essex, and you've just moved out. Is that right? No, I'm still in Essex. Are you moving out? <coughs> no. You're moving away from Rod. <coughs> no. All oh, right. <coughs> probably deeper into Essex. How come he's Fine. moved to Essex then? I said, well, probably to be near Kenny. Can he live in LA? Did, did he move from... I think uh, he's got houses kind of all over, isn't oh, he, really? Oh, one of them, is he? One of them. <laughs> I do like I yourself, Bernard. That's what I want to be one day. <laughs> How um, many houses have you got? Two. Where's yeah. the other one? Uh, the Palmas. No, one's in uh, Manchester, one's in uh, Stratford-on-Avon, just where we got to do the Phoenix Festival. Oh, and that's the reason handy. why we're doing it, because it's very handy for me, you know. Right. Uh, I'm glad that's explained. Yeah. Um, I don't know, the faces were kind of like that, weren't they? The faces mm. played that sort of music, and maybe his point is that it's returned to that and nothing's new these days, you know, in the late 90s. That, apart from, you know, some things, I, the prodigy, you know, mm. doing something new. Pulp, of course, goes without mention. Mm. The, you know, a few groups are doing something new, but um, there's a lot of. Uh, Music that refers back to um, earlier music. Yeah, I think it's something to do with the fact that we're at the end of the millennium, you know. And if you look at fashion, clothes refer back, you know, it's like 70s revival, Everyone 60s revival, steam. some revival, and we just wait for the millennium and then something new will come along. Rod's yeah. obviously he approached Skunk and Nancy, he approached Oasis. Did he approach Pulp? To do a cover no, of he your didn't. track? Did he, he didn't. Did he approach the Prodigy to do Smack yeah, My Bitch Up or something? No. Didn't funnily enough. Well, what would you feel if Rod said, um, "I really want to do Blue Monday"? Is that okay with you? I'd uh, speak to my accountant see if it was a good <laughs> idea. For that third house in LA. It's about time another mix of Blue Monday came out, actually. So uh... it's been a long time coming. <laughs> the, uh... actually, didn't you have a Vimerama in that in the video? Is that right? Is it? Is yeah, that that's right. Yeah. Yeah, because that's actually what inspired me to buy my Vimerama. Is it really? Yeah, I just thought I'd throw cool. that in there. Yeah. What's that? Dog, it's dog. A dog. Ah. Yeah. You know that sort of grey blue dog that's in the video. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I know the dog. Yeah. Well, so you, know you got the, one. Can saw the video and thought. Permission to go at the toilet. Can I have that dog? Can we just ask one more question to Jarvis, please? I turn the radio mic off when I go at the toilet. <laughs> no, let's ask one more question. The B side of the single at the moment, cocaine socialism, uh, it's causing, you know, the kind of obligatory furore. What's it about? <clears throat> Well, it, it, that w that's old, you see. That was done in, like, November 1996. Right. And then, you know, like, the, the election was coming up and that, and 
I thought, you know, I was keen on Labour getting in. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that our song would have made a great deal of difference, but it just seemed not a good idea. So we kind of redid it and everything. And it was still hanging around, so we thought we may as well put it out. Did you want to put it out this time as a comment about the Labour government? Well, I don't know. I mean, it's up and down. I mean, I've been away for a few weeks as well, but, I mean, the Northern Ireland thing happened, and, and if that if that takes, then you can't really... You can't really argue with that, can you? You know what I mean? So... What are you... Uh, you know, although there has been the stuff like um, people having to pay to go to university and that, I mean, it's weird because, you know, generally I hate students, you know, with, oh yeah, I had two pounds side, I got really smashed and all that kind of thing. But I think that the right to an education is, yeah. is something that helps people to escape and helps them to do something with their life, whatever, and you shouldn't, it's already kind of privileged, as it's easier for a middle class person to go through university, you know, so, so to make it worse. So are you into labour? Are you into labour then? I don't know. It's like, as I say, it's hard. It's, I, I really want in the heart to believe in it, do you know what I mean? I think a lot of people like that, but a lot of people were really excited when they got in, you know. Mm. And it was like the next day people felt like, oh God, something's changed. Not, no, even, well, even, if, you, even think, if you didn't think that, think oh God, they were going to be told that something had changed. You know, it, you know. I think you can't tell think it has. No, but you know what I mean? There's something in the air. Yeah, but there weren't. But do you know what I mean? But something had changed as in one lot had gone and another one had gone in. And what had made that occur was people had done that. And I thought that was a good thing. And and But don't you think that whatever party was in now, someone would moan about it. You know, you'd have to moan about it because just human nature is to criticise. Because that euphoria is now over and people are... Yeah, but I mean, no one's going to go, actually, going to go, yeah, they're great. Mm. You know, there's that... It's well, hard I'd like to, to do, do that. that. I'd like to. I mean, I know it's probably quite uh, unrealistic, but, you know... If, you, if um, you got the invite from Tony Blair to go to Number 10 and have a conversation, would you go? Or go to one of his little parties? No. no. You wouldn't? Never. I think it's really bad if, if you I get... Would, if they've got all this cocaine down there. <laughs> <laughs> No, but it, that when was a joke. Band, right. <laughs> music and politics, I don't think it, it never really works because. But you've kind of. You've I, know I'm, the I know I'm contradicting myself. Right. Here, but no, because it, I was getting hounded by him, like saying, can we, can we rely on your support to right. rock the vote and all this kind of thing? And I, I. So that's what I thought gave me the right to write a song about it. But I, it's just because uh, music deals with emotional things and. Politics is all about kind of compromising and trying to please lots of people, or, you know, whereas in music you just have to please yourself, you know, and kind of have something quite... Yeah, but don't you think it's good that they're actually thinking about young people and not ignoring the issue completely? Mm. By asking you to get involved, they're actually thinking about what young people want. I yeah, don't think that's a good thing. Don't, they, don't they, they come up with their own view, you know, their own... something of their own to relate to young people? Why do they have to rely upon Jarvis to, to relate to because them? Because he's the you know uh, the middleman. He's the middleman, really. Yeah, but you don't. Because you you young people can't aren't look at interested and say, in "Oh, well, he's, in, he's into pulp, so he, he must be cool." Well, yeah, what's, your, what's your, your disillusionment with them? Um, is it just politics in well, general? I, I know nothing about politics. I really, I know nothing. Yeah, I but don't that's even why know. they have to get in touch with people like. Jarvis, because most young people don't give a fuck about politics, yeah, but I'd and they try to get him into it. If I saw it, Jarvis you know? being involved with it, I'd probably have more of a view on Jarvis than I would on the on the party. Yeah, but it may, think, it may think about a political party instead of just ignoring it and switching the TV off. It wouldn't though. I'd, as I say, I'd have more of a view about Jarvis than I did about the party. But, Jarvis know. being involved with it, I'd probably have more of a view on Jarvis than I would on the on the party yeah, but involved Yeah, it may think about a political party instead of just ignoring it and switching the TV off. It wouldn't, though. I'd, as I say, I'd have more of a view about Jarvis than I did about the party who was involved in it. Yeah. Yeah. And I think you it'd know, be better and, if, and, you know, that they were inviting people to vote for him because of what the policies were rather than saying, I like this band or I know how to play their way to heaven on the guitar, you know what I mean? It's like a bit like turning up at the Brit Awards and stuff like that it's, it seems a bit desperate it's like your dad turning up or something you know what I mean it's like <laughs> I'm really hip and as soon as somebody tries to do that you're yeah, going but it's like okay. it's, yeah. better, it's better than yeah, the totally government agree. just blanking out young people yeah. and going look shut up and stay in the house shut up yeah because then people will do something well because they'll react against that it's like this thing with the doll you know like saying again I might be misinformed because I've been away for a bit but into something where you can kind of 
get away from having to go and apply for jobs if you say you're in a band. I mean, that's going to be hilarious because there's going to be all like, <laughs> like 50 year old blokes off housing estate turning up with a guitar like, going, come on then. Yeah. <laughs> They'll all be doing cigarettes and alcohol Which and primal that, screaming rocks. That'll be a good laugh. That's all that'll happen. You're not going to get any good bands out of that poll site. But it'd be funny to see them all turning up, signing on. Okay, we'll leave that there so that we can get Bernard's <laughs> toilet break in just a second. I've got the time. <laughs> but this week, against a backdrop of glassy-eyed acid house nostalgia, sees the publication of the second edition of Matthew Collins' brilliant ecstasy culture called Altered State. This is it. Uh, ten years on from the summer of 88, house music has fragmented into a thousand sub-genres. Before we try and make sense of those heady, loved-up days, we'll trance dance back in time. For some reason, whenever I see videos like that, the image of Jimmy Corkill going, the lights, the lights, just won't ever leave me. You have to have seen Brookside to understand that. Uh, Keith, ten years on, what does it mean to you looking back at Acid House and rave culture, watching videos like that? Um, well, that, that was one of the anthems as far as I'm concerned. Um, yeah, I suppose really for me that was, that was my best going out days ever and, you know, um, if I hadn't have sort of moved into having fun with the band and stuff, I, I'm sure I'd still be sort of searching for something that equaled that sort of a buzz, you know, going out and um, was yeah, it a very special it. time for music in general, or you know, not just for yourself? Um, yeah, I suppose it was really. I mean, it was a turning point as far as sort of um, sort of pushing the dance, you know, dance music right to mm. the forefront and stuff. Mm. You produced, yeah, like, the archetypal rave hits like, um, like Charlie and stuff. How do you feel about the Prodigy's role, pushing the boundaries of rave, taking on another step? Um, it's hard to be involved <laughs> with something and, and look at it and... and be objective. Yeah, you know, with, um, but to look back and, you know, to have been a part of something that I was so into is, is, is a really cool buzz, you know, to think that... Um, I'm sure people will look back at, at, at the real sort of rave scene that was, you know, for the brief time that it was a very real sort of underground thing and, you know, you drive around and you'd see other little groups of cars with everyone sort of like bobbing around in it and you'd sort of, you know, you realise you'd, you'd been out for the weekend and, and they had and no one else knew what you was doing and even if you tried to explain to other people where you'd been and what you'd done, it, it wouldn't make any sense to them whatsoever. Um, you actually met Liam and Leroy at a rave in uh, Braintree, is that right? Um, well, it was, it, was a, it was like a club night. Um, Can you remember that first, that night when you met them? Um, I knew Leroy prior to, to, to that and Lee, Leroy, uh, um, Liam used to DJ at like after parties. You know, the barn was just a, a meeting point really 
it was there was, a moment when you got together and like the seed of the prodigy oh absolutely started. i mean we had a tape me and leroy had sort of been out been to rain dance something like that and come back and i said oh check this out this is liam you know the guy who does the you know dj's here and there and what have you and um you know check this out this is his tunes and we was like put it on and it's like yeah this is really cool really cool and then sort of i wondered you know sort of started getting carried away with how we could put a, some sort of show together and whether he'd want to do it and then the next friday went up to him and sort of you know do you want to do something you what know, was the early stuff like was it what what was um was it any i'd good, say basically yeah it was phenomenal you know, was it so, stuff that we actually got to hear? Um, it like some yeah, you know, event? like Android and, uh, you know, We're Gonna Rock and, and everybody in the place. Um, I suppose there was ten tunes there and uh, you could have put any one of them tunes on and it would have rocked any of the parties that was going on. When was your first performance? Um, the Labyrinth. Labyrinth. What was it like? Yeah, it was good. Yeah, it was good. It was like, um, it was like Hackney. Deepest, darkest hackney, and and you know, I just remember saying to Joe, the guy who, who run the place, um, what other bands you had here? Sort of thinking that there might have been some of my old favourites. You know, the Jam had been there once upon a time, or something like that. <coughs> and he said, "Oh, we've had like two bands, but they got dragged off stage and beaten up, and it was, you know, and this is our first night going on." And, and what happened? But, no, it worked. It rocks. He, he he put us on on the Friday night because he thought it'd be a bit safer for us. And then, uh, and then said, you know, you've got to come back and do the Saturday. So we come back the next week, did Saturday, the Saturday night. Uh, honestly, I don't think, you know, it's as if we haven't stopped. You know, we did that Friday, the next Saturday, the next Friday and Saturday somewhere else. And I don't think we've stopped since. It's literally been like that. Yeah. It's crazy. Bernard, you experienced both Acid House and Punk. What was more influential on you? I say Acid House is more fun. Um, when Punk came around, I was pretty young and... I was a bit fucked up when I was younger, you know. So by the time Acid House came around, I was kind of a more stable person in myself. Mm. And uh, when, it, when it first happened, I was in Ibiza with New Order Recording Technique. We were there for three months. But to be quite honest, the scene was, when we got back to England, the scene was better there, no matter what you read. I remember going to, I think it was Billingsgate Market, some uh, underground, yeah, acid house parties there, literally underground, and uh, it was really good. It was. Re I always think it's a bit like. Um, I always thought it was a bit like going to church, you know, when you see like uh, American kind of gospel black churches and everyone's tripping out on it. When you on a dance floor and they play, they were playing acid house. It was a bit like that kind of quasi religious experience, although. Obviously, religion wasn't involved, but it was just a load of people in a room all doing the same thing and all thinking the same thing. And I thought that was great because um, so much of what we do today is individuals living in the, on their own little islands. People, um, you know, it's that thing that Thatcher said that there is no society, there's just individuals. Mm -hmm. And I think people are too isolated and... The, the whole Acid House thing was about people coming together and being a group and the opposite of that Thatcher thing. So when I thought it was all, a really good thing. When did it change, thing. do you think, and why? Uh, well, in Manchester, I mean, I can't speak for London, but um, in Manchester, obviously, with in being involved in Hacienda, um, um, it really took off there. Mm. And it started about 87, really, in Manchester. And then started getting corrupted about 93, 94. All the gangsters started moving in. and Corrupted by? Gangs mm. and guns and uh, violence, really. Um, I think a lot of part of I the think when it, it, it kind of went mainstream because it started off as, I see now it started off as an underground movement. Mm. And then the, the sun and the mirror got hold of it and, you know, started saying what a disreputable yeah, thing it was. And, and, you know, them being sort of literally underground, you know, in cellars and stuff, and you know, people really, think, you know, thinking that these couple of blokes were from the sun or from the mirror and stuff like that. But um, it was when it went mainstream. It was the lawlessness of it all, really. Mm. You know, that without sort of violence and stabbing and, and real sort of heavy shit, it was the lawlessness. You know, like I remember going to Energy or something, and 
all the cars just pulled up and just stopped, parked up in someone's front garden, across the road, across the pavement, across to the next front gardens. And the whole road was blocked for like a quarter of a mile with just cars. Everyone just gets out and was just running for this warehouse, dodging the old bill, diving in through the window, and then that no one cared if the car was there in the morning. I remember going to uh, Spectrum, which was at Heaven, in Charing Cross, and uh, it was an all-dayer, an all-nighter, and, um, you know, everyone was really looking forward to it. Loads of people from all around the country came. So that was another thing that got, like, Cockneys and people from the north coming together, mm -hmm. and there was an all-dayer and all-nighter at Spectrum, and everyone got in there, and after, like, 20 minutes, the police closed it down. So everybody left, and there was a Burger King across the road. Everyone in the Burger King got to turn the radio on, you know, up, and everyone got going in the Burger, Burger King. King. So they couldn't beat it, and that was Fantastic. another good. Yeah. That was another good thing, you know. Yeah. Jarvis, um, sorted for ease and wins. Where were you coming from when you did that? Don't say the Orbital or the North Circular or something, but you know, kind of, what what was behind that song? Well, it was me just remembering it, you know, because. Do you, do you kind of identify with the memories that? Both oh yeah, I mean, the, the, what kind of made it go downhill <coughs> for me was when it was in official clubs, because it was part of the excitement of it was that, that we had to go through all this cloak and dagger thing of ringing a yeah. number at a certain time and then be at this uh, service station like for a certain time, look and around for somebody who can tell like you where you go. For, um, for 400 people, you know, it was only like 400 people who so knew about exclusive. it. And then you, you, you went in a room and you were locked in for like 12 hours. They shut the door. You were locked in 400 people all thinking the same thing. Mm. I'd agree with all that. I mean, and then when it went a bit official, it kind of seemed to get a bit Because that sounds more of a comment about the, the downside of it. Yeah, but that would just, it was just because what I thought about, because, like Bernard's saying, you know, this thing of everybody thinking the same thing. And, and I can remember the first one we went to, which things never matched up to that, because maybe because I didn't know what to expect. But the thing that really struck me was you had loads of different types of people and nobody was bothered about what you were looking like or anything like that because yeah, everybody yeah. was just focusing on one thing and there was nothing like you know everybody's going to get pissed and then there's going to be a fight it's going to break out in a bit or everybody's trying to cop off with somebody else's girlfriend or something people were just into dancing you know and that was quite a it was like what i'd always wanted going out to be like and suddenly it was like that you know i mean i think that's like one of the, you know when you hear jarvis talk about it it's almost like word for word what you'd say about it, and maybe what Bernard would say about it, and so when you heard that and, three and, and sound, you realise that, that yeah. you know, yeah. like when you know, when Bernard's saying that everyone was on the same vibe, that that just goes to prove that you know, it was at different ends of the country, and everyone was on the same thing. Yeah. You know, we'd meet up with people from Manchester, and you know, you did have the country sort of become very small, and you was prepared to move around and travel. And if it was worth going to, you'd be there. And but do you remember the um, the feelings of when you realised it was that you weren't getting what you wanted from the raves? It wasn't as exciting anymore. And <coughs> but I was, was kind lucky because the band had I started, so. so you know.